surgery. Um, I think this is the most critical slide at any professional uh, forum uh, discussing medicine, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and that's the disclosure slide. And if you go to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, this slide uh, presentation is kakistoscopic. It just flashes, and you don't. You see, there's you know it's full, but uh, nobody really discusses how many hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars that they have been paid by the industry for which the device they are speaking about. Uh, and from my experience with trying to get my talks accepted. I've kind of studied that a bit, and I've also kind of studied the structure of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the program that selects content for that meeting, uh, and generally found it, it tends to be somewhat conflicted. Um, other than my personal experience and that I am an arthroprosthetic surgeon, and that's my work, and hip replacement is my favorite thing, I don't have any financial conflicts here. I, I don't, I've never uh, had any relationship with the financial relationship with the arthroprosthetic industry uh, and I have made a decision not to do any type of paid legal work, which I think is really the only real way I could turn my passion uh, directly into gold. Um, I have a long history with hip replacement. 34 years ago, practically to this date, I observed my first hip replacement in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, my medical student colleague eventually became a radiologist, was passed out on the floor, and I was in seventh heaven. I said, this is great stuff. Um, I became an orthopedic surgeon through a somewhat circuitous route. I actually did my internship in internal medicine at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, Learn quickly that internal medicine and me were not a good match, and then spent five years in the public health service, and then went on to orthopedic residency uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon. And then I went back home to practice. So I have a, a 34, 35 year exposure to hip replacement. Um, notable thing in 1992 when I started uh, private practice, I started a collaboration with Dartmouth Biomedical Engineering Center, which was the first and probably, uh, in my opinion, uh, the best and most independent explant analysis laboratory in the world. Uh, they were the first uh, and they pretty much pioneered all the techniques to do uh, explant analysis. An explant is an implant that failed. Uh, they're rarely analyzed. It would be kind of like a general surgeon operating on a tumor and never sending the tissue to pathology. Uh, but of all the explants of arthroprosthetic devices that are done in the United States, I would estimate that only a fraction of 1% ever have an explant analysis. And it would be my conjecture and argument today that if we did that more frequently, many of our misadventures in arthroprosthetics over the past decade could have been avoided. I had the benefit of joining a practice where my senior partner was this man who came to Alaska in the mid 70s from Mayo Clinic. He is holding one of the uh, most implanted, best proven devices, hip devices ever implanted. That is the Charnley Low Friction Arthroplasty. It is a uh, 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 simplicity uh, is, is uh, simplicity is sometimes very important. And he's holding um, in his left hand a stainless steel single piece stem that's cemented in the femur. It has a relatively small head. He did that deliberately because he wanted to increase the thickness of the plastic that he cemented into the pelvis with the socket. And uh, that increased the, the thickness of the polyethylene and decreased the friction of the joint. And uh, Dr. Nolan's involvement in this implant in the United States was when he was in his residency at Mayo Clinic, he followed up the first 2,000 patients that Mayo Clinic placed this device in. Now these were not experienced surgeons with the device because this was the first American experience, one of the first large American experiences with the Charnley Low Friction Arthroplasty. And these 2,000 hips were implanted in three year period between 1969 and 1971. 
This is still considered the gold standard hip replacement in which all others are measured. And the remarkable thing about this is even with trainee surgeons with this device early in their experience, if you were greater than 60 years of age when you had that device placed, the chance of it failing was practically nil. Uh, and with the misadventures we've had since then, you could make a strong argument that anyone over the age of 60 years of age ought not to be implanted with anything else. This is a conundrum for industry because that is more or less a generic implant. You could probably make that implant for several hundred dollars, uh, which is, you know, um, uh, order of magnitude less than the more complicated prosthetics that are commonly used today. Although the Charnley arthroplasty is still commonly used in uh, countries, Scandinavian countries and countries like England that have cost conscious, uh, more publicly run medical systems, it's very rarely implanted presently in the United States. You will note though in the kind of pink part of the curve there that the Charnley uh, would start to fail uh, to some degree in individuals younger than the age of 60, particularly if they are male, heavy, and active. And that's really what spurned the continual fiddling with the design, which sometimes perhaps has improved things, but more often than not has made things worse, and has always made things more expensive. The reason that devices like the Charnley would eventually fail was because plastic wear particles would affect bone and bone would get absorbed. We call that osteolysis. And this has been a frequent picture in my practice coming uh, and picking up Declan's practice after he'd been in practice for 20 years. I wound up revising many of Declan's joints and although Declan was true to the faith for his first 10 to 15 years of practice, he eventually was charmed away from the Charnley into some of the newer generations of devices and sometimes he says he's always regretted that because I rarely, I think I've only revised two or three of Dr. Declan Nolan's Charnley hip replacements and I've revised many times that number of the generations of hips that he put in following the Charnley that did not perform as well, were more expensive. Uh, and at the time that I started private practice after my training, was also when, as a surgeon with interest in redo surgeries and very curious as to why things fail, I got to know these individuals very well. This is the crew at the Dartmouth Biomedical Engineering Center at about the time I started sending them explants. Uh, and they're a very independent lot, they're very academic. Uh, and they have stumbled onto most major flaws in arthroprosthetic designs years before it became common knowledge and years before those implants were either changed or taken off the market. After 10 years of diligently sending them explants, uh, we, hit, uh, we hit gold. Uh, we didn't really hit gold, but we had an interesting finding. Uh, I ran into a series about the same time of two women who in short order of time failed four hips, two primary hips, two revision hips. They all did it by the same manner. It was at a period of time where we thought we'd improve the plastic so it wouldn't wear through and we'd have less wear particles and less debris. And in our enthusiasm for that technology, we made the balls bigger. By making the balls bigger, we made the plastic thinner. And in the right set of circumstances with a relatively small boned individual, usually a woman, you'd be putting in a rather smaller shell to fix to bone in the pelvis. And if you're trying to put in a big head, you're always robbing Peter to pay Paul. And we were winding up with some plastic that was five millimeters or less thick in certain critical areas, like where you see the crack. That's upside down on a light table, so it lights up. And that's the rim where it's got the crack. And this was a not so active, overweight woman who failed this hip after 10 months. That got my attention. Uh, and the surgeon looked at it and said, well, let's try that again. And so he kind of put in the identical liner and about 10 months later, it failed again. 
And then, so the second time around, he said, well, maybe I gotta get Tower to help me redo this and try to figure out why this is happening. And then I had another very similar woman and the same story. And so all of a sudden in Anchorage, Alaska, which is not the arthroprosthetic uh, capital of the world, uh, I had a series of four failed Zimmer longevity liners, which was the most popular hip system implanted in the United States. And I put together the first case series of these catastrophic thin polyethylene liner failures, uh, which was resulted in pretty much the redesign of most presently commonly used uh, metal on plastic or ceramic on plastic hips, which are the most commonly used implants in the United States today. Uh, this wasn't done on industry's dime. It did not come out of industry's lab. It did not come out of the experience of a surgeon that works with the arthroprosthetic industry. It came from this hick guy in Anchorage, Alaska, who, and I'm really not a very high volume surgeon. It's just I'm interested in hip failures and I'm interested in revision. Now, I had a conundrum because uh, at the time I described the longevity failures I had been a believer, I was really hopeful that this improved plastic was going to solve these problems of hip replacement in a young active individual and I was 50 at the time and I was very active. So I was shopping for a hip myself and I had gone through all the recommendations I make for my patients. In my average patient, if I see a male in his 40s with early uh, hip arthritis, I usually get to know that patient over a period of 10 years before I replace his hip. Because many of these symptoms can be managed by fitness, weight loss, activity modification, occasional leave, Advil, aspirin, etc. But once hip arthritis progresses to the point where people are taking narcotic medications, can't be active and are gaining weight, they generally benefit greatly from hip replacement. And again, going back to the 1970s, we in the 1970s had a technology that was very safe with a very, very low failure rate. And uh, as, as a guy who does hip replacements, it's like you come up to bat and you hit the ball out of the park 95 out of 100 times. If you follow some basic precepts, which is you, you select your patients carefully, you pick your implants carefully, uh, and the 5% are usually lightning strikes, you know, some of which are modifiable, like infection. I don't think infection is 100% preventable. I wish it was. Certainly that's about a 1% bugaboo out there with hip replacement. Instability is one of the things that has really driven the uh, big heads, thin plastic, and eventually my nemesis, which was uh, the metal on metal hip. So I was a very active individual as an endurance cyclist, uh, both road and mountain bike. So in 2006, when I'd done my last ultra endurance race and realized I wasn't gonna do that on my native hip again, uh, from what I knew, which I would say is above average for an orthopedic surgeon, and certainly way above average for the average patient, uh, I had much more information to select surgeon and implant than almost anybody. And any time as a physician, and I think any time as a patient, these are the critical things that go into a choice of a drug or an intervention or even getting a lab test. There's risks to getting a lab test. Um, what are the alternatives? What are the risks? And what are the benefits? Well, we know the, the benefits of hip replacement for an individual with an end-stage arthritic hip are immense. You can take people out of wheelchairs and you can return them to a normal level of activity. You can take people who enjoy a high level of activity and you can return them to that high level of activity. Uh, there's still risks, there's infection. Uh, we know traditionally, when you put traditional technology in very active individuals, you know you're probably looking at an eventual re revision down the pike. Revision surgery is generally more complex and more expensive than the original operation. But we're highly successful now in hip revision surgery. Uh, when I first started practice, uh, the results of hip revision surgery were not so great. 
And I would make an argument that our evolution with technology to deal with the primary hip replacement, I think we've done a poor job over the past two decades. When it comes to the evolution of the technology to allow me to redo a hip, I think we've done a good job. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, in, earlier in the panel discussion, uh, one of the panelists made this great discussion. Americans always assume newer is better and they always assume more expensive is better. And in this, in the case of primary hip replacement, a hip done the first time, it's totally paradoxical. Cheaper is better. Um, and older is better. Uh, like I say, if you're going up to the plate and hitting the ball out of the park, 99 out of 100 percent of people, for someone over the age of 60, you're nuts to change that. You know, Alaska, we have a saying, we're fishermen up there, you don't leave fish to find fish. You know, you're catching a fish every cast, you don't walk 10 miles upstream hoping you'll do better. Um, so what do we look for in hip replacement? Well, you know, certainly we'd like to last it forever. And we know 1970s technology, if the patient's over 60, is likely to last forever. So there's no reason to innovate. Patients always want instant recovery. It's a big marketing point. You see minimally invasive surgery touted all over the place. It's nuts. It's like asking your mechanic to do a valve job without taking off the valve cover. Uh, the most common reason for long-term failure of a hip replacement is that the surgeon didn't optimally position the implants. Uh, there's been lots of good studies right now that show that the size of the incision has nothing to do with the speed of the recovery. And in hip replacement, my big concern is instability. Uh, if you put the hip in through the belly button, you still have to go through that hip capsule. And that's a critical thing for stability of the hip. So I turned around and said, hey, no, I'm a maximally invasive surgeon. Uh, and I want you to use your crutches and take it easy for the first six to eight weeks because I want you to heal your hip, your hip capsule. And then I'm going to give you the release to do roller derby because then you won't dislocate. Uh, any surgeon that tells a patient anything other is full of shit. You know, I think he's been romanced by marketing and technology and computers and x-ray machines. He still has to, you know, cut the hip capsule. And if he's telling his patients to do things quicker than I'm telling patients, he's taking a risk that those sutures will break, the hip will dislocate. And I'm not going to take that risk with my patients. I'm just going to say, hey, cool your jets, man. Six weeks. We're hoping this will last your lifetime. Be patient with me. Go out. I'll let patients walk. So go out walk with your crutches 10 miles a day if you want to. That's safe. I'll let patients put full weight on the leg. But you know, don't go off and play hockey You know, a month after surgery. That's just stupid. Um, so th there's a lot of marketing stuff going on. So. Had I been more knowledgeable when I made my own decision, I would have done what I presently advise my patients, which is with a new plastic, as long as you don't go way overboard with head size and you make the plastic thick enough, the new plastics aren't showing wear. I've been using the new plastics now for 10 years and have not seen any sign of wear and have not had any failures. But you can't push the head size too big. You push the head size too big, you increase the frictional torque of the implant, you in increase wear, and you take this risk of catastrophic failure with thin plastic insert. So um, I'm back to using a 32 millimeter head, which is somewhat larger than the 22 millimeter head that I used when I started practice, but I rarely go bigger, bigger than 32. And over the past decade, surgeons have been become accustomed to using 36, 40, 44s or anatomically sized heads. And this slide shows the sacrifice you make when you use that really big head. You make the plastic really thin. It also increases the frictional torque of the joint, which was the whole beauty and magic of Dr. Charnley's original design. And the reason that I still see some of Declan's patients that have 30 years on their Charnley arthroplasty and they're still functioning well, even though they were done when they were quite young. But back in 2006, I had somewhat jumped onto this bandwagon that is an endurance cyclist who tries to ride his bicycle to Nome, that I didn't want to take that risk stability-wise as a smaller head and resume that activity. Uh, because of my experience with the cracked 
uh, thin polyethylenes with the designs at that time. I didn't want to push the head. I didn't want to go with a big head with that technology. So I got romanced by the metal on metal. Uh, that's a metal on metal bearing. The advantage of the chrome cobalt material is very strong. It's very hard. You can polish it really smooth. And it allows you to put a really thin socket into the pelvis without expending excessive bone. So you can put what I call an anatomically sized head, a head the size of the original equipment, on the femoral side. Now you can do that two ways. You can either put a stem in the femur, which we've been doing since the get-go, uh, and it's a very well-proven technique, or you can do a technique called hip resurfacing, where you merely take the existing head, machine it, and cap it. I was always suspicious about hip resurfacing, because hip resurfacing has come and gone every decade since the beginning of time, and it's always underperformed the stem with whatever materials were available. And also, I was aware that hip resurfacing is a more invasive procedure because you have to release all the tissues around the hip in order to get that ball out from the wound so you can resurface that head. And I also knew it was a technically more difficult operation for the average surgeon to do than placing a stem, which orthopedic surgeons are very comfortable with doing. So I elected to have a stemmed metal-on-metal uh, -metal hip and I was totally unaware at that time that that meant by nature uh, or by nature of the FDA that the device I got was a 510K device because the hip resurfacing was enough of a departure from uh, other technologies. They had insisted that the hip resurfacing devices go through a full pre-market approval process. Uh, and that has implications down the pike uh, that I'll discuss later in the talk. So here I was in 2006, a 50-year-old, overly active male who knew too much. And also, although I felt that I, because of my academic experience, because of my prior publications, because of my relationship with Dartmouth Biomedical Me Engineering Center, because I've been president of the Anchorage Orthopedic Society, who brings up all the faculty to discuss uh, uh, CME meeting annually and I brought up the big hitters from the Mayo Clinic and elsewhere in the world on hip replacement, I thought I was one of the better patients informed in the world to make this decision. And this is what sold me. This was what we were told about metal on metals. You can use that really big head. You know, these hips ought to be more stable. That harder on harder bearing should produce less wear. Uh, because of that, because you have less wear, they ought to last longer. Maybe I wouldn't need a revision. Maybe it might last me my lifetime. Uh, there was questions about whether or not they would actually perform better. I was skeptical about that. I had 15 years of experience as a total hip surgeon. And in my experience, hips either work really well or they don't work at all. Uh, and I think this whole thing about high performance hips is a myth. I, 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 the hips either work or they don't work. Uh, there's a question whether hip resurfacing saves bone. That's kind of gone by the boards. And there was a question whether hip resurfacing might be an easier revision in the future because it saves more bone. That's gone by the boards. We now know that's not true. So I drank the Kool-Aid in 2006, and I really did not choose wisely. Uh, it's kind of like the uh, Crusaders of the Lost Ark where the guy picks the cup, and it's a fancy cup instead of the wood cup, and you know, he turns in, shrivels up, and turns into a skeleton. Um, I not only chose a, a, a bad technology, I chose the worst of the bad technology. And my surgeon helped me out a little bit. He knew I was a nutcase, and he took every precaution that I wouldn't dislocate, which meant he covered up the back door, which is how he put the hip in. By covering up the back door more, he uncovered the hip, the front. Uh, I do the same thing all the time to my patients where I'm really concerned about a posterior dislocation. He knew I was a cyclist. But that, without him knowing it and without me knowing it, set me up for an accelerated mechanism of failure. Um, so when I chose my hip, I thought I was almost following my usual precepts of how I choose implants for my patient. Before I had my metal on metal hip, I'd never put one in. Because I had some suspicions about the technology and I didn't really want to subject my patients to an unknown risk unless I took one out for a test pin myself. Uh, but the thing about hip replacements is 
If you're dealing with a technology that fails at a rate of half a percent per year, in order for a surgeon to switch to a new technology, you need to be certain that that new technology has a long enough track record and has been done long enough period of time and the people who are reporting the data are honest enough that you really know uh, that the new technology is matching the performance of the old technology. And I call this a holy hand grenade of empirical science with hips. And I think the reason we have these issues with hips that maybe we don't see as much with drugs is if you're working on a new drug to treat cancer and the patient's going to be dead in six months, the, sh the time span is fairly short to figure out what works and what doesn't work or what helps and what doesn't help. If you really do the math, it takes almost 10 years to figure that out with a hip replacement. This puts industry in a real conundrum because innovation and new stuff sells. Uh, and the true development, innovation, and verification cycle of a new technology and hip replacement ought to be 10 years. And I think the pre-market approval process, you know, when the hip resurfacing devices, I think those hips were followed, hips, patients were followed three or four years. It's much too early for certain problems to show up. And when you're dealing with an entirely new technology, there's a risk that the failure mechanism of the new technology is not going to be the one you expected from the old technology. And that's what I call the killer rabbit of tribiology. Tribiology is the science of bearings, and the hip is just basically a ball bearing, uh, and it's got forces on it. Uh, and we've known that wear debris is generally what's driven failure in the past with the metal on plastic hips or ceramic on plastic hips. Well, now it became uh, the metal debris in my hip because of my surgeon's concern about dislocation, my concerns about dislocation, my implant choice. Uh, my implant was, uh, and you can see in this x-ray how much of that ball is uncovered in the front. That set me up for a phenomenon called edge loading. And hard on hard materials, I'd gotten away with this with metal on plastic hips forever. I, I rarely, if ever, had a problem with this position of parts and pieces with a metal on plastic hip. This plastic is a relatively soft material and it's fairly tolerant to edge loading. These hard on hard materials are not because they don't deform and you wind up getting point contact, microscopic point contact enough that the forces on my hip, even just walking and swinging the hip, were enough to gouge the metal. As soon as you gouge the metal and make it rough, you have the potential to produce a lot of wear debris. So I was really curious, and fortunately, I only put in six metal on metal hips during my honeymoon period of the first 10 months. My honeymoon ended when my hip became progressively painful with activity. And that was really odd, because my patients just don't complain about that. So because I was curious and I was interested in hip replacements, how hip fails, I started measuring my levels of actually cobalt and chromium uh, in my blood. And they were many, many, many times normal, and many, many more times what had been reported in the early studies. And as time went on, they kept on going up, and I kept on making phone calls to Depew and all my buddies who developed these implants with Depew, and pretty much anyone who would listen to me, they said, ah, Doc, you know, we think cobalt's good for you. We've never heard it to be a problem. Um, but during this period of time, I started to develop a slew of medical issues that I had not had before. I developed a mood disorder, I started have some subtle memory issues. Uh, uh, I developed rashes. Uh, I didn't do as well exercising on the bike. I, I, in cycling, we have this term burning a match where you can sprint. I just totally lost that ability. I started having issues at altitude. Um, eventually, what really caught my attention as a surgeon is I developed a, a pretty significant breast tremor in my right hand. I'm left-handed. That was worrisome. It wasn't affecting me in surgery, but I said, well, if this gets to my dominant hand, I might be in trouble. But the real wake-up call was when I developed retinopathy. Uh, 
Uh, I'd already developed tinnitus and a little bit of high frequency hearing loss. It's not unusual in Alaska males. There's lots of guns and snow machines and everybody loves cylinders up there. But I, I, I'm, I'm a bicyclist, I'm not a cylinder guy and I don't shoot guns. The tinnitus was irritating. But when I started developing flashing lights in one visual field and when I started reading book, you know, reading a book and losing words or letters, that was a concern. Uh, it also happened to be the time where uh, the game was up as far as the hip was concerned. At 42 months, I had night pain, which was requiring medication. Uh, I wasn't able to cycle anymore because of the amount of pain. So I was basically back, as far as my hip concerned, where I was before I had it replaced. So I had a clear indication to have the hip revised. So I got my partner, who's well-trained in revision surgery, to revise my hip. And it was a surprise. He found a crankcase in there. Uh, a lot of metal debris, and when he cut the skin, it kind of bulged up, and you got in there, and there was all sorts of fluid. And uh, there was a lot of reactive soft tissue. We call that a pseudotumor. Uh, and I'd lost a lot of the ligaments around the hip, which would normally hold a hip in place. So it's ironic, the one thing that drove me to having the metal-on-metal -metal hip condemned me to the complication I feared the worst, which was hip instability. I've gone on to have nine dislocations of my revised hip. I finally learned how to keep it in. Anyone who has that problem, I recommend Pilates and being really fit. But eventually, if anyone's experienced a hip dislocation, it puts a serious kink in your entire day. Uh, and you're just kind of down and out, and you're on the floor, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. But if you have some really educable family members, they can learn how to put it back into you. If you, you know, put it back in if you, if you can learn how to relax well enough. Um, but, so I experienced a systemic problem, which was cobaltism. Uh, or cobalt poisoning, uh, which affected uh, the nervous system, the heart, and the rashes, and all this other stuff. But I also experienced the local complication, which generically are called pseudotumors. Uh, this is what I had both a lot of loss of tissue or tissue necrosis, but I also had this inflammatory response too, uh, or what's called chronic inflammation. So what do I do with my implant? Well, I send it back to Dartmouth. Uh, and Dr. Mayer, who's the oldest gentleman in that slide, calls me up and says, sweet Jesus, this looks like it's been, you know, this looks like someone took a machine tool to this. This material was so hard, it was not thought to wear. And that's my explant. Uh, and the, the cutaway shows you this gap. This was supposed to wear in microns per year. Mine wore on the order of hundreds of microns per year, which explained why my cobalt levels were 100 times what they were supposed to be for people with implants. And that's what the, the magnified view of what the surface of my head looked like, which uh, stimulated Dr. Mayer's remark. But uh, Dartmouth is a highly capable laboratory. Uh, in a relatively short period of time, uh, they had a full analysis of the hip and they said, Steve, this is amazing stuff because these are not supposed to do this. They're supposed to be protected by a f uh, fluid film lubrication. They're not supposed to wear at all. And then gradually Dartmouth's been getting more and more explants, uh, some showing even more wear than mine. And that's a model of one of their graduate students' wear scar that you can actually calculate the amount of wear volume of metal from that. Well, I was content to think I was the only person in the world that had this, uh, but the only patient that I implanted with an ASR had the same issue. Not to the same degree. Fortunately, his cobalt levels were about one a quarter of mine. But then I had what we call case after case. I had two. Again, I only put in six metal on metals. So I went to the State uh, Department of Epidemiology in Alaska, uh, and he said, well, this is really interesting because nobody talks about cobalt poisoning from hip replacement. You know, we ought to, and I could do this at a state level and not jeopardize eventual peer review publication. So we put this out in May of 2010. 
I had already written the paper actually within a month of my hip coming out with just one case, and that had been turned down by an orthopedic journal of not being of sufficient interest. Uh, summer of 2010, uh, when the state report came out, CDC in Atlanta reviewed it. Whoa, this is really interesting. We'd like this to go national. And we went to all this effort to condense two pages into a couple paragraphs for them. And there were emails flying back and forth between Atlanta and Alaska, and the state epidemiologist was doing this uh, with my help. And the last email we got from Alaska said, well, this is a medical device. We can't do this without permission of the FDA. And the FDA basically said, bugger off. Medical devices, we're studying this, and medical devices are our turn. We're not going to let you publish this. So it took uh, another half year for me to get this in the orthopedic literature. Uh, and again, it was two cases. Uh, and it seemed to just be totally bottled up in our most prominent American orthopedic journal. I later learned that the section editor for HIPS is a J&J consultant. Uh, eventually, I actually personally approached the chief editor of the journal, who's a pediatric surgeon, and he kind of said, oh my god, we have to publish this. Uh, and he allowed me to take the paper that had been rifted, you know, down to practically nothing, and he allowed me to put Dartmouth's material in it. And it was kind of a fortunate delay, because by then Dartmouth had their technical analysis of my bearing. Uh, Dr. Tolo, who's the chief editor, gave me a phone call. He says, Tower, we're going to publish your paper real quick. We're going to expedite it and put it out electronically. But so you're not alarmed, you ought to be aware it's being accompanied by a commentary commissioned by the presidential line of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Well, I was kind of proud of that until I read the commentary. Uh, and the commentary was, nobody's reported this before, and millions of hips in general have been implanted, and about a million metal on metals have been implanted. Uh, and it's really weird that a patient's reporting his own case, even though I had two, so his conclusion was this is very, 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 very extraordinarily rare, if it exists at all. And I was kind of scratching my head. I said, well, I only know of two ASR patients, and they both have this problem. So in you know, my standpoint, it wasn't rare at all. Um, Dr. Jacobs was a vice president at that time of the academy, and he was consultants for three, or had been a consultant for three different companies involved in metal on metal hips. He is a very scholarly guy, uh, but he had also done a lot of the foundational research on the metal on metal technology. At the time, when that commentary came out, I kind of went to war with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, which was kind of an uncomfortable thing to do. Uh, and at that time, the president was a J&J, &J, former J&J &J consultant. The first vice president was a former J&J &J consultant. Dr. Jacobs was a third J&J &J consultant. Uh, not J&J, &J, but Zimmer, Smith Nephew, Wright Medical, all of whom had been on metal products. Again, these guys kind of shed that during a year that they're president. So they can say, well, we're not conflicted for this year because we're not working for industry for this particular year. How many go back to working from industry? I think it's probably pretty high. You know, whether the guys who get royalties from industry uh, don't collect those royalties during their presidency, I kind of doubt it. I think they still collect the royalties. But I don't know for sure. And then, uh, so I said, well, okay, that's the way it's going to be. So I just started, you know, basically I called them and say, Offer, yeah, gee, you know, you guys have a journal, you have a review journal, I can write papers on this for you. Nobody was interested in that. So I started putting in scientific papers for the annual meeting, and they just got turned down year and year, uh, time and time again, including panels where I recruited world authorities like the Dr. Graves, who's a total joint registrar from Australia, which is the first total joint registry, national one, to really blow the whistle on this. So what we've learned since then, since 2010, we're learning more and more patients are having this problem. It's probably kind of a cumulative thing. Certainly, I was extreme case with the amount of wear, but we see more cases with that degree of wear. We've learned that the failure rates of hip resurfacings, which are still being done because they're pre-market approved devices, that they're failing at rates anywhere from 20 times to five times that of 1970s metal on plastic technology. 
but there's still surgeons out there that believe it. There's still patients that will travel halfway around the world to have a hip resurfacing done here at New York, at Hospital Special Surgery. Dr. Sue is still a big believer. There's a Dr. Gross, I think, in South or North Carolina who's a big believer. Dr. Pritchett, still a big believer in Seattle. And they're still putting these things in wholesale. I, I, you know, with enough research you learn, cobaltism was not a new thing. Relatively new thing in total hips, but it had been described basically since the 1950s, 60s when we used cobalt to treat anemia. And that's a whole different cute story. There's also a story about adding cobalt to beer, which uh, put a lot of alcoholics into heart failure. And actually, eventually I learned I was not the first person to describe cobalt poisoning by hip replacement. I was just the first person to describe cobalt poisoning by hip replacement with contemporary metal-on-metal -metal implants. Because there have been multiple cases where metal heads were worn by ceramic debris that were reported before my case report. Um, it's, I think the systemic stuff is a snake in the grass because the early presentation is kind of uh, garden variety stuff for anybody in private practice. Mood disorders, rashes. I, I get a little tinnitus, you know, I'm not hearing my cell phone. Uh, and peripheral neuropathy, I did not have that. Um, but these are all fairly common uh, issues in someone in general practice. I suspect, although most of the case reports, it's really the, the neurotoxicity is what catch people's attention when people are completely deaf and blind and they have a huge cobalt level, the diagnosis eventually becomes self-apparent. Maybe, maybe not, but when they open the hip and find all this metal debris and whatnot, then they make the diagnosis. But I think the heart may actually be the most sensitive tissue because pretty much all our Alaskan patients to date have had uh, some sign of their heart not working as well, although not many are symptomatic. Fortunately, most of these things are reversible. We're in our process of learning more and more from additional Alaskan cases. We now have about 10 Alaskan cases of systemic poisoning uh, in uh, about uh, 30 patients that have had revised metal on metals. Uh, and it's really curious to me that we knew when we adopted these implants that the average patient with a hip resurfacing with a well-functioning metal-on-metal bearing has a cobalt level of two. The level for concern for industrial exposure is one. And most of you sitting in the audience, if we drew blood from all of you and got a median, it would be 0 0.2. So the average patient with a well-functioning metal-on-metal hip has a blood cobalt level twice that allowed in industry and 10 times that of someone who does not have a metal-on-metal -metal implant. We're learning that very high levels, our experience with systemic cobalt poisoning is suggesting that the mild stuff gets pretty frequent when you get to a cobalt level of 20. But there have been several cases, including several cases of heart failure, with patients that had levels in their teens. Again, the silver lining in this cloud is it's generally quite reversible. Although the harder stuff, if people are profoundly blind, they may not recover full vision. And the neurologic recovery, if they're blind and deaf and have profound peripheral neuropathy, that improvement is slow over a period of years. So we got a million patients out there with these things. You would think we would be calling them in and monitoring them like crazy, or not. Uh, this is what I've done recently. I've got several papers in the hopper. But this is the 17 cases I've been able to identify that have already been reported in the literature. Uh, and what you see is those patients who are sensitive to cobalt there seems to be a fairly typical dose response curve. The higher their blood cobalt levels are, the longer the hip has been in, the sicker they are. Interestingly, we have found several patients with very high cobalt levels have had significant implantation times who have absolutely no toxicity that I can find. They're both women. Uh, so I think there's individual variability to toxicity. Those people who are sensitive are probably have a fairly similar response to the material. 
and we really don't know what percentage of individuals are sensitive to the cobalt, but our experience in Alaska suggests it's significant. Uh, the organized American orthopedics, uh, as opposed to Australia, uh, says, well, he, he, we probably only ought to check cobalt levels only if patients are really having hip symptoms, because we don't want to get people overly alarmed. Um, my concern there is many of the patients that have had systemic toxicity don't have much in the way of hip symptoms. And another thing that concerns me is a lot of patients we've seen with very significant damage at the hip have not had much in the way of hip symptoms. So I think what we've learned is we need to be very proactive about getting these million of patients at risk in measuring their cobalt levels and getting metal suppression MRIs of their soft tissues of their hip to learn what's happening at their hip. Another big concern of a million patients at risk that are getting older is kidneys don't work as well as patients get older and cobalt goes out through the urine. And there have been case reports of earlier metal-on-metal -metal designs which were not known for making patients very cobaltemic where with renal failure, the cobalt levels got very high. And this is where we're at in Alaska. There's a mistake in this slide. We've revised 27 patients with 29 metal-on-metal -metal hips at this point. The, these are the ones I know about, mainly within my own practice by different surgeons. It turns out I was not the first author to describe systemic cobaltism. I was the sixth author. Uh, I was the first one to describe a series. Uh, and either already through publication or through communications with other researchers in Europe, um, I think at this point we're beginning to realize that the systemic toxicity is actually fairly common in the patients that have a cobalt level of greater than 20. It just depends on how hard you look for it. These are still being done. This is a patient we revised who had a cobalt level three times mine, or almost three times mine, and he was not a happy camper. And this is a pre-market approved device, and these are still being implanted. And there's surgeons out there, including Dr. Sue at New York Hospital for Special Surgery, who really pushes this as being the latest, greatest thing since sliced bread for males like I was when I had my hip done, active, large bone males. Almost all surgeons, except for very few, like Dr. Gross in North or South Carolina, have just won't put them in a woman. But there are several surgeons who are such believers that they will still put them in women. Uh, so, uh, you know, what does all this mean? You know, I think we're dealing, you know, I, I think this is the, the root issue of the question is, Whenever you know, a president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery talks about this problem, you know, they'll always preface it by hip replacement is the most successful operation in the history of man. And yes, if you use the right components, if you pick the right patients. But clearly, metal on metals, in my opinion, at least, relatively speaking, is not a cost-effective operation. Because they fail quicker, they destroy the tissues around the hip, you have the potential of poisoning the patient, um, and you can do all these cost-benefit analysis where you assign, you know, a dollars to years of improved life or whatnot. Uh, the curious thing is to take the United States where we spend a huge amount of money on medicine compared to a place like Norway. And because Norway is much more conservative in their choice of components, and they're much less commercialized, and it's more of a public medicine system, you know, they probably do a hip for about half the cost, maybe even less than the United States. Their revision rate is probably about half that of the United States. So when you look at the cost-benefit equation, you're hitting it either way. If you do a real meathead orthopedic uh, number crunching, uh, and I think I'm lowballing this. I think we're looking at about $11 billion of increased expense related to the metal and metals in the United States over a period of one decade, and that includes revision costs. Um, so where are we at? All these reasons I picked the hip that I picked have basically been disproven at this point. Uh, hip resurfacing is not of any benefit, requires a metal-on-metal -metal bearing. Uh, 
uh, nicely shown by a very large analysis of the um, National Health Service data in England that uh, compared to Charnley's type technology, they're failing at much higher rate. Really, really pushing the ball size. There's no reason probably to go above 32 uh, for stability purposes. I don't think high performance's hips exist. I think that's a marketing myth. Uh, hips either work or they don't. And certainly all hard on hard bearings are out. Another hard on hard option doesn't poison the patient, uh, but it's very expensive is ceramic on ceramic. And they have not been shown to outperform either ceramic on plastic or metal on plastic. So we would have saved a lot of money over the past decade in the United States if we had only implanted 1970s technology uh, at a fraction of the cost. So what went wrong? How do we fix it? Uh, my analysis is this is just conflict of interest across the board. And it, the industry and their rock star surgeons bring the science to the FDA. The FDA rubber stamps it. Uh, these same rock star surgeons go to the journals and they go to the meetings and they promote it as science. Uh, and then for regulation, the FDA relies on these same surgeons when they start to see problems. Th those are the guys they call up. Hey, we think we have a problem. How, which, how should we deal with it? After I had the issue uh, a year ago, FDA had a big meeting about the metal on metals. I tried to move heaven and earth to get put on their panel. I was the only surgeon in the United States published on the topic. They said, you're not an expert. I said, why aren't I an expert? They said, well, because you don't work for industry and you weren't forwarded or you weren't forwarded by your professional organization. So that's their criteria for expert, explains a lot. And then within professional spheres, you know, your average orthopedic surgeon in your community is a really good guy. You know, he is trying to do his best for you. But if the information he's getting is so polluted, and if a guy like me can't get a pub paper published in the orthopedic literature, or can't get up in front of a podium at a national orthopedic meeting, he is operating with biased information. Uh, and I can tell you in Alaska where awareness of this problem is very high, the surgeons who have put these in are abhorred. And we are proactively getting our patients in and we're trying to rectify the problem. And we're also trying to study the problem. And we're trying to create the first regional joint registry in the world that also incorporates explant analysis. Because I think if you're gonna solve this conundrum, consumer reports like to test stuff. But there's no testing thing that really works for arthroprosthetic devices like the human body. And what you need to do is you just need to change things a bit. And for certain populations like pre-market approval uh, type studies, you need to make sure that any of those fail get carefully analyzed and the people who are analyzing the failures are somehow independent. And that's what Dartmouth Biomedical can do. I mean, that's their forte. And even though these guys are the world's experts, it's hard for them to get on the podium too, for all the same reasons. Um, so summing this up, you know, metal on metal hips, United States about a billion dollars a year. Uh, they're still putting them in, so the problem, if anything, may be escalating. Um, the design surgeon of the ASR got paid $20 million for his work on the ASR. It's been termed the largest medical device failure in history. Last academy, he was on five podiums. I applied for five podiums and I got none. Um, big concerns at present, I think, are the one million patients that have these devices that are not being systematically monitored. And I think that's priority number one, is to raise awareness among patients and among primary providers that this problem exists. If a patient has a metal on metal hip, that ought to be on their problem list. Because that patient needs an annual cobalt level. And they also need an annual metal suppression MRI of their hip to make sure that the tissues around the hip aren't getting eaten up. And you can't see that usually on a plain x-ray. Uh, and again, um, I think these broken development processes need to be addressed. The only way you're gonna address the conflict of interest and the bias in this is to get some 
consumer entity at the table that has resources, you're not going to stop innovation. And I, I don't think we should stop innovation. But you need a skeptic at the table to say, gee, well, let's not innovate on the patient population over 60 where we already have inexpensive technology that works every time. There's no reason to go over there. There's no reason to make that more expensive. And there's no reason to take the risk that the innovation will backfire and make things worse. So what do we do? A premature implant failure ought to be treated like a plane crash. It should be an NTSB approach. Um, that implant, that explant ought to be studied. The circumstances should be studied. Um, the way you do that is you have good regional joint registries, but you combine, you combine it with a probable cause analysis. None of the joint registries now have a probable cause analysis. They just collect data, they collect failures. They assume if they don't collect the failure that they're dealing with a success. Um, these canary in the cage sentinel early implant failures like I had are almost always multifactorial. But the multifactorial things like a stupid overactive patient, slightly malpositioned implants, bad implant design, brought out the potential for the accelerated wear. So I was a very important case in that regards because I was a sentinel canary cage. But I started having symptoms at 10 months after my hip implantation. The ASR had already been widely on the market for four years before mine was ever implanted. So you can multiply me by hundreds as far as patients that likely had that experience. And this particular implant was marketed to my demographic. Overly active young individuals who were gonna do what I intended on doing. So it wasn't like I broke any rules. So I think we can make this a heck of a lot better for a lot less money. And I think the way you do that is uh, consumer groups need to get involved in facilitating organizations like this to do good explant analysis and support that effort. Because right now shops like this are running a shoestring and it's all indirectly industry money. Because the big grants from NIH and stuff don't go to this type of research. They go more to basic science type research. Was combining these guys with a regional registry that sends every explant to them would be a very, very powerful tool. And that's what we're trying to do in Alaska. And that's it. I think we're going to have, a, we're going to take at least five minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question? All right. <laughs> I wish I could tell you how uh, I've felt my blood pressure rise listening. I am angry. So forgive the emotion. Um, five hip replacements in two years started with hip resurfacings, have a diagnosis of metallosis, cobalt levels of 3.6, chromium levels of 4.2. You haven't addressed chromium at all. But oh, that was a slide I had, you know, as it is, they were about to pull me off the stage <laughs> okay. because it was an hour. I got a slide on chromium. Chromium is very interesting. The reason we're blaming cobalt on everything is because the cases of systemic toxicity look just like the cases of pure cobalt toxicity. That is, when we treated patients for anemia, it was only cobalt. There was no chromium. When they added cobalt to beer, they added cobalt. They didn't add chromium. Right. I think. My concerns about chromium are more to what it does to the tissues around the hip because chromium kind of gets squirreled away in the tissues around the hip. The chromium levels are almost always lower than blood levels. The chromium levels go down slower once the hip comes out. I've, my experience has been the cobalt levels come down quite quickly, like they did in my case. My main concern about chromium, one of my six patients now has an abdominal lymphoma that I did a metal on metal in. His levels, he's approaching double digit cobalt levels. Uh, his lymphoma is within the hip drainage. Uh, he has other risk factors for lymphoma, like Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam. But again, these sentinel failures are almost poly, uh, multifactorial. And both uh, 
cobalt and chromium are potentially are altered genetic material. So potentially they're oncogenes, uh, onc oncogenetic, I guess would be the proper term. Um, and uh, there have been rare cases of lymphomas and sarcomas reported around implants. But I think for the systemic issues, I think cobalt is a bad actor. Uh, I think possibly around the hip, chromium may be playing a role. If we do see problems with tumors around hips eventually, like lymphomas or sarcomas, it wouldn't surprise me that chromium would be the main thing driving that. But I think those are going to be pretty rare, fortunately. Question. If you had a brother that was an equestrian, rode horses, and he needed to go get a hip replacement. How old is he? 57. Ceramic head. Uh, and a plastic socket, plastic socket liner. And if you really believe the English literature, you, you, you could, he would probably do just as well if you cemented the parts and pieces the way Dr. Charnley did. Okay. Although you'd be hard pressed to find a surgeon in the United States who will do that. But a cemented or uncemented ceramic on plastic hip okay. ought to work well. Okay. And don't let the surgeon put it in through the valve coat. Okay, great, right. thanks. Yeah, well, let the surgeon make a big incision. Okay. Two quick questions. Uh, in an ordinary blood test that one would have, would the, uh, would the cobalt show up in that, or does it have to have a... Do you have to order, trace metal analysis has been done for a long time. So it's tricky because, you know, these are parts per billion, so they are low concentrations. In fact, Tom Schmalzried, who is the design surgeon of the ASR hip, he came up to Alaska a few years before I had mine. It's kind of a dog and pony show. He was promoting his product. And I was doubting Thomas. I kept him asking, yeah, Tom, I hear that people's cobalt levels go up a bit. And he looked at me and said, Steve, how can something measured in parts per billion hurt anybody? So that, this is the design surgeon of the ASR, and that was his level of biologic understanding of heavy metal toxicity. Uh, but no, you have to order it specially. It needs to be collected a little bit differently. But it really just needs to be ordered properly. It just has to be ordered as a, a serum or a whole blood chromium or cobalt level. I usually, if I have a patient with a metal on metal implant, I order both. Because the you know Downing Thomas's will always say, well, gee, you know the tech, you know they screwed it up or there was metal contamination. But you know almost always you'll see elevations of both ions, and that you know generally puts the Downing Thomas's to, to rest. And the the other thing is the lever is elevated. Um, I almost always repeat it a few months later and make sure it's not a, a spurious result. And the other question is a partial hip replacement. Is that similar? Uh, in pro having problems as a full? Yeah, the partial hip replacements are generally used for people who have fractures, and you're only replacing the ball. So that would, although that might be a chrome cobalt ball, it would be rubbing on articular cartilage or bone, and there'd be very unlikely that there'd be any significant wear. Thank you. Are there similar issues with uh, knee replacements? Years, many decades ago, there was a metal-on-metal metal knee replacement, but presently there's no real similar issues with knees other than there is likely a fairly small population that has true hypersensitivity to some metal alloys. And chrome cobalt is commonly used to resurface the, the upper side, the femur side knee replacement. Um, and it's interesting because knee replacements uh, often, uh, not often, fortunately, but sometimes really active patients who've had knees for a very long time will wear through the plastic and the chrome cobalt uh, femur will rub on the softer titanium shell. And those patients normally don't have elevated cobalt levels because the titanium is so much of a softer material and it wears preferentially. I haven't, I'm not aware of any instance of titanium toxicity. I've seen a lot of titanium metallosis, and it seems to be relatively benign in the soft tissues, and although it becomes elevated in the blood, 
I've yet to see a case of toxicity. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Nobody thought that chrome cobalt toxicity from metal on metal hips existed. Hi, um, my name is Jolene Chambers. I'm a failed implant device alliance, FIDA. Um, I'm also a reject from the FDA. Uh, I was representing my brother who has a failed implanted elbow. It failed after four months. And I was trained as a representative for the FDA. Um, I've also served for PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It's, it was part of the Affordable Care Act. It was intended to do uh, patient-centered research. I was wondering if you'd be interested in partnering with me um, in approaching PCORI to do patient-centered outcomes research on these implanted devices. Maybe use Dartmouth to uh, yeah, generate a, a grant. Frank Smith, who's sitting there in the white, conspicuous in the white shirt and the red tie, um, he's my organization. Because we're what we're attempting to do in Alaska is have a regional implant registry that incorporates explant analysis. Mm -hmm. And you need allergies to stainless steel. Nickel cross reacts with cobalt. So if you were my patient and you needed a total hip, I would put titanium metal pieces in, it would be a ceramic ball, and it would be a plastic liner, socket liner. If it was a knee, uh, that's there's also an option there uh, there's a, a product that does not use a chrome cobalt there's a material called oxinium that they can use on the femoral side uh, and that's a ceramicized metal and same deal there you, the other materials would be titanium or plastic but is there, my question is, is there I, I wouldn't, the, the preoperative testing, yeah. I don't think is, if I have someone with your history, I just automatically go to the implants that I know won't cause that problem, and I don't do the testing for that reason, because I'm just going to avoid it by avoiding any materials that, but with your history of problem with fracture implants, that's what I would do. Thank you. And I would save the money on the testing. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tower. Uh, thanks for being here.